Several months ago, a friend in religious life told me that she didn't want to be poor. And I was very refreshed by her honesty. And the conversation sent me to re-examine the meaning of poverty. Because poverty of itself has no intrinsic value. So of course we don't want to be poor. But spiritually, poverty is important because it expands our capacity for God. Being empty, we must await all from Him. And so the poor are particularly blessed because they live in a state of radical readiness and dependence on the Father who does not disappoint. As monastics, we're called to live many different kinds of poverty. And among these kinds of poverty are factual poverty, the poverty of virginity, the poverty of our monastic death, and the poverty of the human condition. I'm often teased at the monastery because I like I like to have precision of language, or at least I aim for this. And so, I want to I want to make sure that we're defining our terms here because when we talk about poverty, we're specifically not talking about destitution. If Jesus wanted us to be destitute, he wouldn't have told us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, and we wouldn't have, as a Catholic Church, been ministering to the the ill and the homeless and the poor for the past two thousand years with all of these Catholic charities. And so. I just want us to be clear about that because, because while destitution really contradicts human dignity, this isn't what we're called to live, poverty reveals the truth of human dignity. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about poverty. Poverty is one of the, one of the evangelical counsels that Jesus preached to all of his disciples. All of his disciples, meaning that it's not just the the monastics or the priests who are called to, to poverty. It's, it's all of us, all of us who are followers of Christ. Um, but as monastics, we, we live this poverty in a more radical way. So we don't have our own cars. We don't have our own cell phones. We don't actually own anything. So what is mine is free reign for anyone in the monastery, which mm -hmm. we often joke about raiding each other's cells. But the, the beauty of this is that in living this life of poverty, this radical life of poverty, monastics are able to reveal this truth that our worth and our identity is not in the things that we own or what we have to give. Our, our worth and our identity is in who we are. It's whose we are. It's our relationship. It's the fact that, that we're sons and daughters of God. And this, this is the reality that we reveal by living a life of poverty. And it's the reality that we're all called to live. As Eastern monastics, we really immerse ourselves in this, this desert spirituality. And knowing our poverty and our emptiness is integral to living this spirituality because we trust that as we live a life of poverty and we empty ourselves, we go out into the desert and there we encounter the Lord. We trust that he is there to fill us. We trust that he speaks to us as he spoke to Israel through the prophet Hosea in saying, I will allure her and lead her into the desert and, and speak tenderly to her there. That's, he, wants to, he wants us to empty ourselves, to meet him in the desert, to speak tenderly to us. So that's an important point that when we empty ourselves, we're meant to fill ourselves with Christ. And the reason I say that's important is because even as monastics, there's this temptation 
when we live this life of poverty to kind of mitigate that poverty with these human consolations, you know, and, and that really diminishes what we can gain through the poverty. We, we recently heard a quote by Bishop John Michael in a homily that he gave. He said, you can hide the Holy Spirit, which came to dwell in you through baptism by being full. You become a monk or a nun to have nothing so that having nothing, you may receive everything. So this is our life as monastics to receive everything from God, to rely totally on his providence. But the truth is this is, this is the call of all of us, not just monastics. The laity, we're all called to, to be completely poor, to empty ourselves entirely so that we can be filled by him. So I remember a while back I was reflecting on just the struggles that the people around me were having, particularly with a very um, obvious barrenness, either difficulty conceiving or just struggling with um, different infertility problems. and. As I was praying for them and just seeing my own barrenness in my monastic life, like I had a lot of problems with sickness and taking medications and not feeling like myself. And how are you supposed to evangelize if you can't even articulate sometimes your name? Um, and so that was a particular struggle for me. And I was praying with that. And I just suddenly realized that the most uh, important figures in scripture all came from barren wombs. Samuel comes from Hannah, who's barren, and Sarah gives birth to Isaac in her old age and is barren, and um, Elizabeth gives birth to the forerunner of Christ, and Anne gives birth to the Theotokos, like Mary's mom was barren, and um, and then Mary herself, though she wasn't necessarily barren, she didn't know man, and so it was impossible for her to be pregnant, and yet her um, her just openness to God's will brought about so much fruit. And um, and for thousands of years before her and after her, her yes bore fruit for all of us. And, um, and so I realized that our struggle with barrenness really isn't an obstacle for God, that the most barren fields bring forth the most exquisite fruit. And it's not, I mean, think about the Israelites in the wilderness, like God provides everything. He brings water from a rock and he feeds his people in the desert where there's no food. Um, the barrenness that we're struggling with isn't a struggle for God. Um, and so Mary saying yes to God's will, like blessed is she who believed that what was spoken to her would be fulfilled. Um, that yes to the impossible and her trust in God, um, was so fruitful. And, you know, I was thinking about that just as it relates to my own vocation. Um, before I entered the monastery, because I have a nursing background, the Lord spoke to my heart that I would be a nurse for souls, not to be afraid that I'd be a nurse for souls. And a while back, I was I was praying with that, but it was kind of a frustrated prayer. I was like, well, I went to school for a long time to be a nurse. <laughs> like, how, um, how am I supposed to learn how to be a nurse for souls? And still, like, that... Um, focusing on that feeling of barrenness and that helplessness and not knowing how to be um, a spiritual mother. And I just heard the Lord respond to that, you're in the school of suffering. And I realized that in our poverty, um, whether it's physical poverty, emotional poverty, or spiritual poverty, when that's just surrendered and open to God in our vocation, that's what brings forth fruit, like it comes from that suffering. One of the poverties of virginity and celibate barrenness is this hiddenness of it. Because most of the ways that we exercise our motherhood in the day-to-day -day are completely unseen. It's the prayers that we're praying over the course of years that nobody ever knows about. It's the suffering that we are joyfully embracing and trust that it's going to be fruitful for souls. It's the letters from strangers that we respond to because they're seeking God. Um, and these things aren't necessarily recognized as motherhood, even by us in those moments. Um, and so what's happening is that we can't name our children. We can't count our children. We don't even know who they are. But what we have is faith that our spouse is faithful. His love can only be fruitful. And so when we get to heaven, 
that will be like the first time that we see the souls that we've carried in the wombs of our hearts. For years, I had been attracted to living a kind of monastic poverty, no matter what my state in life would be. And when I was finally accepted for entrance into the monastery, the reality of that monastic death became much more real. And um, as I had to give away all my belongings and say goodbye to my family and my home and friends and everything, I experienced like every emotion under the sun. It was just horrible, <laughs> but um, some of it was good but and fun, but a lot was horrible. Um, because now what I didn't expect was that I couldn't make my poverty look however I wanted it to look anymore. Um, I, I just had to surrender everything to the will of another. I can definitely relate to that because when I first came to the monastery, I had my ideas about what I thought would be the most difficult things to give up. And those were hard. They were really hard. But I've come over time to realize that the most difficult thing for me to give up is simply my own will. I really had no idea how hard it would be to give up control of what I do and how I spend my time, which is determined by our monastic schedule and by obedience. Our life is spent in prayer, work, hospitality, and community life, and most of the time we can't determine what those things look like, and that can be a real death. Um, but recently I read from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6. He says, Our mouth is open to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide. You are not restricted by us but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. And I realized through that, that it's not monastic life that restricts me. It's my own attachments and my own will. And so this is the death that I need to die. But in this death comes freedom, comes resurrection. And this is where faith comes in because we need to trust that through this death, through this letting go of everything, that we really do receive God, even if it doesn't feel like it, and that this death is fruitful for ourselves and for others. Yeah, like the morning before I came to the monastery, a really good friend of mine texted me, and he asked um, like how I was feeling in the midst of like this big transition that was coming up. And I told him that I felt both bereft and exuberant, that there's this combination of like the cross and the resurrection in embracing the poverty of monastic death. I remember hearing a talk a few years ago on the incarnation that really changed my view of my poverty because I found out that I wasn't alone in my poverty. The priest who was speaking talked about how the, the fathers of the church used particular Greek words in order to describe the phrase, he became man. And they could have used a few different options, but the one that they chose was to create a whole new word that actually encompassed this, this reality that Jesus took on all of humanity in his humanity. Meaning he didn't just become a man, but he became all of humanity within, within himself. And when I heard that, I realized, wait a second, he's taken on my humanity, my weakness. I, I can find my poverty in Christ. Um, and I can also find, I can find the, the places that are difficult for me to love and my sisters there as well. And so these places of shame um, that I'd hidden before, I realized were actually places of encounter. And that instead of my poverty being a place that was empty, was alone, was actually a place of union, that I was able to find Christ in the heart of the Trinity. So encountering this truth that God so much loves me and so much desires to be united to me, um, that he took on my humanity, I realized that if God desires me this much, then I also need to desire myself. Um, and so on my retreat this year, he really, he really gave me this personal challenge. Uh, I've prayed often with, with a lesson that I learned from, from the book, He Leadeth Me by Father Walter Chiswick, this understanding that um, the situation, the external situation I find myself in is God's will. But this year on retreat, I felt the Lord really showing me that 
I, in fact, am the situation in which I find myself. And that includes both my goodness, but it includes both my weaknesses and my poverty. Um, and so I had, to, I had to look at that and see, do I desire myself in those places? And it really brought home this quote from Father Jacques Philippe in the book Interior Freedom, where he talks about how God loves with the tenderness of a father real actual people, not the person I'd like to be, not the person I want to be, um, but real actual people. So in order to accept ourselves and be truly poor in spirit, we have to be healed of our wound, which is also our sin of self-rejection. To the degree that I'm rejecting myself, I'm also rejecting the Father's word of love spoken over me. My spiritual father once said that the result of the fall isn't only my concupiscent rejection of God, but also my concupiscent rejection of self. And so these two things need to be healed in tandem. In Poverty of Spirit, Johann Baptist Metz talks about, he has this image of lifting and accepting the chalice of my existence. And this acceptance of this chalice offered to me is what obedience to the will of my creator looks like. Um, and it's only faith that enables us to drink this chalice because only by faith can we say with St. Paul, as he said to the Corinthians, that we have this treasure, the treasure of the indwelling Trinity, um, in earthen vessels or jars of clay, very fragile holdings um, that make known the uh, transcendent power of God. Not only individuals are earthen vessels, but also communities. And community life really becomes this great equalizer of people. We see both the best of people, but also the worst. You know, we strive every day that we would be, as St. Paul says, of one mind, as he says to the Philippians. But really what we see more often is our brokenness, our weakness, our inability to change ourselves. And that can become kind of despairing. And so we begin to, over, like, to come up with this question of, how do I overcome my poverty? But that's not really the right question to ask. It's, it's much more important to see that my poverty is actually a place of union. It's not a place to be gotten over, but a place to learn how to live from. A privileged place, because in community, there's nowhere to hide. I have to drink the chalice of myself in my neediness, my brokenness, my woundedness, exactly as I am. Because that's the only thing that I have to offer my sisters or anyone else. And it's precisely that woman that God desires me to give. Trusting that God is active in the midst of our poverty enables us to have hope that he's likewise active in a world that seems to be falling apart. Because I know him dwelling in my darkness and my pain, I'm able to recognize him in a world that's riddled with darkness and pain. And in this way, poverty teaches us hope. St. John Paul II tells us that monasticism is the reference point of all the baptized. All Christians, according to their particular state in life, called to live out the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Our reflections on poverty, even as monastics, have implications for all the members of Christ's body, the Church. Our hope in offering our reflections on poverty is that you will take them to prayer and ask the Lord to show you the places where you need to be poor or even more poor in order to create the space for him to fill those empty, poor places with his loving presence. We encourage you to ask the Lord in prayer to show you the poverties you may be running away from. What chalices are you refusing to drink? Ask even in trepidation for the grace to desire and say, not my will, Father, but your will be done. In what ways are you seeking to fulfill yourself with possessions and activities? Possessions and activities can become major distractions that interfere and prohibit the seeking of God within. What is the specific death or poverty that the Lord is inviting you to embrace? Share with the Lord your fears and ask him to increase your faith in his divine providence and love for you because he loves you just as you are. We can consent to and even embrace our poverty because of God's boundless and unrelenting love for us and because of the great hope that is in the resurrection and the ultimate fulfillment of union of God in his kingdom. St. Euphrosina, a 5th century nun who, whose ascetical life is celebrated in the East and the West, says that monasticism is a longing for God that knows no limits. It is the beginning of the age to come, 
of the kingdom of heaven still here on earth. We pray that through a life of voluntary poverty of heart, you will trust in God's divine providence and desire to empty yourselves and be filled with a longing for God that knows no limits. Glory to Jesus Christ. Thank you.